Um, I am really pleased uh, to uh, present tonight uh, Andrew Hirschberger, Dr. Uh, Andrew Hirschberger, Professor of Art History uh, in the School of Art here uh, at Bowling Green State University. Um, Andrew got his undergraduate degree at the University of Arizona and his PhD at Princeton, and his, he specializes in research in art history. And uh, so, <laughs> thank you very much. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. Uh, when I was invited to give this talk, I was very happy to connect the area that I love, the history of photography. Uh, I'll speak as loud as I can. Uh, the history of photography to this area of viewing eclipses. And you're gonna see there's a really interesting deep connection between early cameras called camera obscuras and viewing eclipses. So that's part of the talk tonight. And that's one of the things that connects my area of art history and photo history, especially to astronomy and to eclipses in particular. But I wanna start by thanking some people uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Andy Layden for inviting me to give this talk and Dr. Kate Dellenbush for inviting me to give this talk. I'd also like to thank the late Dr. Dale Smith, who probably many of you remember giving talks in this room. My three kids were super lucky, in my opinion, to grow up in this town with this planetarium and Dale Smith running the show for so many years. He was a real friend to all, our family and to my three kids and to me, so I really miss him. And uh, thank you for thank you for recognizing him as well. So thank you. If we could dim the lights again, and pretty dim is better in art history because we want to be able to see these very clearly. Uh, so I want to start with a story, and I'm supposed to stand behind the camera, by the way, so I can't move around as much as I would like. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a story when I was in college. And I happened to be living in Arizona. I grew up in Arizona. And uh, it was super hot in the summer times during college. So I wanted to escape the heat of Arizona. And I ended up working for a summer in Sequoia National Park in California. It was a wonderful experience. One night in 1989 is vividly imprinted on my brain because the night sky was so intense. I had never seen anything like it before and I've never seen anything like it since that time. So this photograph shows my memory of that evening. And when I looked across the horizon, I could see the Milky Way so clearly, it seemed to me that I could just reach up and touch it. I mean, it just literally was right above my head I wanted to just hold on to the Milky Way. It was such a magical feeling. I've never experienced it since then. I hope all of you will have that experience if you haven't already had such an experience. It is utterly transformative. And I think a lot of artists have had similar experiences with the night sky, with the eclipses that they've seen, with other phenomena. So astronomical phenomena in general is very inspiring to artists and to photographers and to lots of people that you're gonna to see tonight in this presentation. So I wanted to start with that little story. And one thing that I loved about preparing for this talk was that I realized that the painting I'm about to show you is 100 years earlier than my experience. So I had this experience in 1989, the painting that's slowly emerging on the screen was painted in 1889. And since I'm an art historian, and I know there's a lot of art history students in the room, I'm wondering, does anyone recognize this painting? <laughs> yeah, Starry Night by Van Gogh, very good. Congratulations, yeah. So this is Van Gogh's Starry Night from, excuse me, 1889. And sadly, the little green bar is blocking your view of the full information at the top. Uh, but this painting is located at MoMA today, at the Museum of Modern Art. So I hope if you haven't had the chance to see this painting in person, that in the near future, hopefully you'll be able to see it in person. It's a very wonderful, magical painting. My sense is that Van Gogh had an experience the night that he saw the night sky in this way. 
and it transformed him as well. Interestingly enough, Petra Chu, the author of the textbook that I sometimes use in my modern art classes, she argues that this painting was painted from Van Gogh's hospital window in a little town called San Remy, which is very close to Arles. So he's inside of his hospital room, looking out the window at the night sky, apparently painting what he's seeing and adding things that he's not seeing, by the way. But Petra Chu claims in her book that what we see as viewers are feelings about life, death, and infinity. And maybe that's what I was feeling when I was so profoundly moved by the night sky. It's kind of a feeling of life, death, and infinity. And if I zoom into this painting a little bit, fill the screen with it, in the inside, in the center of the painting, you see that spiraling form? That's a lovely symbol, I think, of infinity. And I believe that's one of the things that Petra Chu is referring to when she uses that word infinity. And that symbol, by the way, has always been my favorite symbol, the spiral. Uh, the one ring that I've designed in my lifetime that I'm wearing is my wedding ring, and it is the same symbol. I really like that symbol. So spirals are fascinating to me. And by the way, it was really fun tonight when we started with the Star Talk with the older machine, which I love, because we saw the rotation, especially at the South Pole. If we were to look up, we would see the stars, you know, slowly rotating. So maybe that kind of idea is in a sense related to the things that maybe Van Gogh was thinking. So I'm gonna transition now to another painter named Ida O'Keefe. You've probably all heard of Georgia O'Keeffe. This is the much less well-known sister of Georgia O'Keeffe, Ida O'Keeffe, who is also an artist. And she painted this uh, painting called Stargazing in Texas. And of course the date is blocked there. Uh, I think it's in the 1930s, uh, as I recall. And it's in the Dallas Museum of Art today. It's a very cool painting, in my opinion, especially for this talk. If I zoom into this painting at the bottom, Notice some of the details like the dog next to the woman's feet. And then the two people that are kind of lying down on their backs. That's the way I felt on that night in 1989. I was just blown away. I literally ended up on my back looking up at this incredible scene. So these two people reminded me of me <laughs> you know, in that moment. And I love this painting for another reason because it shows not only these animals interacting with one another, but if we go to the top, uh, Ida O'Keefe tacked with little nails, tin stars to the wood frame. That's a really interesting addition. And she's added little foil stars as well. So the littlest stars are made out of foil. The bigger stars are made out of tin and they're tacked to the surface of that uh, frame. So the third work that I wanna show you is a painting by Norman Lewis, who grew up and lived in Harlem. He was also fascinated by the night sky and blue moons in particular were very interesting to him. He painted at least four paintings entitled Blue Moon. And here's one of them. This is dated from 1960. And the Swan Gallery in New York has written about this work. And they say, what we're seeing here are images of nocturnal subjects, like the second full moon of any month is a blue moon. Hence the name, you know, you know the blue moon doesn't happen very often. Uh, so that's the title of this painting. We're seeing images of nocturnal subjects and those images have been repeated throughout his lifetime, especially again, the blue moon. MoMA has also written about Norman Lewis and they claim that he was inspired by the writings and works of art by Vasily Kandinsky, one of the artists I'm gonna show you later who painted a really cool abstract work of eclipses. So I'm gonna show you that later today. Let me zoom into the top of this one first and hopefully you can see, I think this is the moon it might be reflected in water. That's a possibility. Maybe it's reflected in the Harlem River, uh, which is nearby to the area that he's living in and working in. If I scroll up, you know, maybe this moon is up in the sky, though not reflected in water, because there's a, an indication, I think, of another body of water coming into view in a moment at the bottom of this particular composition. Here's part of that um, reason why I think this is a body of water. If I scroll all the way to the bottom and turn around, here's potentially a horizon line. And it does strike me that abstract artists and representational artists are often inspired by natural phenomena, like astronomy phenomena, like the moon, like the stars. 
and eclipses. The next artist is not a painter, but a sculptor uh, that I'm gonna talk about briefly. This is Alexander Calder's work. And if you know Calder's work, he often would suspend his sculptures from the ceiling. This one is suspended from the ceiling with this piece of wire and it is balanced very carefully so that it will rotate. If you were to walk up to this sculpture in the Guggenheim Museum in Venice, has anyone been to the Guggenheim in Venice, by the way? What a beautiful place that would be to go to a museum. I've been to Venice, but I have not yet been to the Guggenheim in Venice. So maybe I'm not alone in that way. But if you go to the Guggenheim, definitely look for this sculpture because you will probably affect it. If you walk up to this sculpture, the air coming off your body is gonna change the relationship between these pieces. They are very carefully balanced so that they will move with the slightest change of the air around it. So if the air conditioning turns on in the museum or if the heat turns on, it's gonna change the way the sculpture moves. Now notice what the uh, Guggenheim curators have written about this. They say yellow moon evokes outer space with stars and orbiting planets. The yellow moon counterbalances the red circle, possibly symbolizing the heat emanating sun. And then they quote Alexander Calder himself as saying, I felt there was no better model for me to choose than the universe. So clearly this artist is very much inspired by the astronomical phenomenon or phenomena that we are studying tonight. And uh, in this case, we've got the moon and the sun represented in this otherwise abstract sculpture. The next artist that I'm briefly gonna to touch on at the beginning is Nam Joon Paik, who's a uh, South Korean born artist. And uh, this is called Moon is the Oldest TV. I'm so sorry about that, that green line blocking your view of the titles. Moon is the Oldest TV. I love that title. That title reminds me of how powerful maybe the moon is. Like many of us probably stare at the television for a long time every day. So we're kind of fixated on this image, this image that changes over time. And maybe moon was like that for earlier, you know, pre-television eras. Uh, so Nam Joon Pike is a television artist, by the way. He's got 12 different televisions lined up on pedestals here. And it looks like they're showing images of the moon. And before I started researching for this talk, I thought they were videos of the moon. He often uses videos in his sculptures, but the Pompidou Center in Paris, which is a really cool museum to visit if you have the chance, uh, notice what their curators say. By adding a magnet to the cathode ray tube, Pike scrambles the electronic signal, transforming it from point to circle, semicircle, et cetera, so as to associate these manipulated images with the lunar cycle. So I can't help but smile that what he's doing here is he's using a magnet. Let me show you a photograph of him. Here's Pike with a large magnet on top of a television that's been designed just to show a point on the screen. And then if you put a magnet on top of it and turn that magnet, you can tune the point into a circle, into a semicircle, into a crescent, and so on. So he's kind of recreating the phases of the moon with this really interesting technique of tuning it with a magnet. So if I remove that photograph of him and then bring in some photographs of some of the phases of the moon, you can see he's trying to capture over time different moments in the night sky looking at the moon, but these are not actually moon images. These are you know, images that he created with magnets. And so I wrote at the top there, Maybe this is Pike's electromagnetic lunar eclipse here. And again, I highly encourage you to look up Pike, really interesting artist. So I'm gonna transition now into eclipses. So this is our first maybe lunar eclipse, so to speak. And now I'm gonna transition into solar eclipses. And I wanna remind you, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that since ancient times, hello, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, delighted to see you. Uh, since ancient times, solar eclipses were often first safely viewed via the camera obscura. And I mentioned cameras earlier. The word camera, by the way, means room. I love that. Many people don't know that in my experience. The word camera means room. The first cameras were room-sized. You could walk inside of the first cameras 
And you could see the image projected on a wall inside this room that you are physically standing in. And in ancient times, people recognized that, oh, these rooms are really helpful for me to view the solar eclipse without damaging my eyes because the sun is so incredibly bright. So this phenomenon that I'm gonna show you is very well known going all the way back to ancient times. And the word obscura, by the way, camera obscura, obscura means dark. So a room that is dark or a dark room, cameras, camera obscuras were the first photographic in a sense, photographic cameras are based on the camera obscura is what I'm trying to say. And uh, here's an early drawing of a camera obscura. It's by a Dutch scientist named Ryanarius Gemma Frisius, whose dates are being blocked, but he was born in the 1500s. And this is called Illustration of a Camera Obscura Observing a Solar Eclipse on January 24th, 1544. That's 480 years ago. Gemma Frisius again was a, a, a Dutch uh, scientist, a physician and a mathematician. He's viewing the eclipse in Belgium at this time. And he's making this drawing of how he viewed it. So here is the sun, excuse me, the sun is behind the moon. This is the moon, the dark uh, face. The moon has eyes and a nose and a mouth. Yeah, <laughs> like we all see, of course. And the sun is being blocked by the moon. So this is the moment almost of totality. Uh, and notice how the sun is peeking out at the top. And if you have a camera obscura, a dark room, the reason why there are images inside of it is because hopefully you have a small hole in one wall. You can do this at home, by the way. You don't need any technology. You don't need a lens. You just need a dark room with one little opening allowing light inside the room from outside. You will see whatever's outside projected inside your dark room, projected upside down and reverse left to right. So we can see the top of the sun here. This crescent goes in through the hole in the wall and ends up on the bottom. Hence, everything high up in the sky is projected on the ground inside the camera obscura. Everything low outside is projected up on the ceiling. And I have to tell a story, by the way, about a camera obscura that happily Clayton, who was in the room, helped me to create and uh, did a lot of work on it. So thank you very much, Clayton. Uh, and uh, one of my former students named Maria Postalwaite, when she was a grad student here, she walked inside the camera obscura that, that Clayton uh, worked on and that I was using for my history of photography classes. And she saw the image of students walking outside the School of Art. They were just walking to their next class, but they were walking on the ceiling. They're projected on the ceiling. It's an absolutely magical moment. And Maria Postalwaite just blurted out, Oh my God, I'm so happy. <laughs> and that to me is exactly how I feel when I'm inside a camera obscura. I see some nods here. Yeah, it is a magical experience. If you haven't been inside of a camera obscura, I highly recommend it. It is very exciting, really interesting. Uh, so this is a well-known phenomenon going all the way back to the ancient world. And it's still super interesting in my opinion. I'm gonna put some text at the bottom and notice what one of the experts on camera obscura says. Uh, this expert's name is Vinsel. In 2007, Vinsel wrote, the oldest employment of the camera obscura dating back to antiquity was for astronomical purposes, for safely observing phenomena connected with the sun, in particular, solar eclipses. And this drawing Vinsel is writing about, it is the first published illustration of a camera obscura. So this is one of the earliest, maybe the earliest published image of this phenomenon called a camera obscura being used to observe solar eclipses. Now I wanna jump ahead in the timeline and show you a more recent photographer named Abelardo Morel, really cool photographer, born in Cuba in 1948. Abelardo Morel almost came to BGSU. We almost got him to come as a visiting speaker once, hopefully we can. Uh, he makes really interesting photographs, in my opinion. This one shows him setting up a box camera. And astronomers do this, by the way. If you look up uh, how to safely view the solar eclipse, you're going to see a lot of illustrations kind of like this. But this is a very simple cardboard box, and he's got a very bright light bulb. 
you do not need a lens, but he likes clearer images. The lens will make the image clearer, but you don't need a lens. You just need a small hole in the box. And you will see whatever's bright outside projected inside the box upside down and reverse left to right. It's a very interesting phenomenon. And I've written at the top there that camera obscuras, pinhole cameras and eyes all work in a similar manner. So all of us have an image that's upside down and reverse left to right in the backs of our eyes. Our brains are processing this so they, they can flip it upside right side up and correct it left to right and then combine these two images. So our brains are doing a lot of work for us that we're not aware of. It's a very interesting thing to think about. If I zoom into this, you can see maybe this a little more clearly. Again, he added a lens here. This is very likely a four by five camera lens. So very clear lens. And he's added it to this very low tech box uh, to create that very sharp image of the light bulb. If I scroll up here, we can see the entire composition. So he's clearly fascinated by this phenomenon that is well known in the history of photography, certainly, because it's the beginnings of the photographic camera. All right, so I'm just gonna compare the Jim Afrizius drawing at the top to remind you that this is the same phenomenon. So viewing a bright object like the sun being eclipsed by the moon shows up upside down inside the camera obscura. And it's the same thing happening here with the light bulb photograph from 1991. So I'm gonna compare that to another photograph that is not astronomical, but I want to encourage you again to build a camera obscura. I have to tell you another story. Once I gave a talk kind of like this inside the public library in Bowling Green. It was for the children's reading room where my three kids also had a wonderful time growing up just like they did with Dale Smith in this room. And uh, we made a camera obscura inside the children's reading room. And it was so fun because during the time that we were viewing the parking lot outside those, those areas where the stories are read, a big white van pulled up right in front of the public library. So this big white van just covered the ceiling of that room and all the kids just screamed out, ah! <laughs> it was so exciting to me. It's a very cool phenomenon. So if you do this inside of your bedroom, for instance, like Abelardo Morel did in 1991, you will see the other side of the street projected upside down and reverse left to right inside your room on the back wall. This will happen. I can guarantee you this will happen inside your room. If I zoom into this, you can see this is his bed. This image was made in Brookline, Massachusetts, in his house, in his bedroom. The image is everywhere, by the way. It's on the bed. It's on the floor. It's on the ceiling. It's on all the walls. The image is everywhere. It's a very powerful image. Now, I hope I don't make you ill by rotating this image. So I'm gonna rotate it kind of like the stars, you know, rotate. I just want you to see these houses in the background across the street from his bedroom are not being changed. I'm just rotating this image now. So you can see how similar Brookline, Massachusetts neighborhoods look to Bowling Green neighborhoods. I'm gonna say that's the house across the street from my house. You know, it probably looks like a lot of streets here in town. So again, I would really encourage you to do this. It's very fun. And he loves photographing inside of his camera, camera obscura. So going back to astronomy, it's the same phenomenon viewing uh, solar eclipses as it is building a camera obscura inside your room. So this is the same kind of an image projected upside down and reverse left to right that we see here and that we see here, and that's actually happening inside of our eyes, but we're not aware of it. All right, now this is the first group of photographs that an American pair of photographers made. It's the first successful photographs of a solar, a solar eclipse made in the United States. This dates from 1854, and it's by two brothers, William Langenheim and Frederick Langenheim. The two brothers lived in Philadelphia, and they must have done a lot of work to make these eclipse photographs with daguerreotype cameras. Daguerreotypes are the world's first photographic process, and they are super cool. A daguerreotype is a silver-coated copper plate. Some of you may have old daguerreotypes in your houses. Don't throw them away. They are really cool kinds of photographs. If you see an image that looks like a mirror, that's a daguerreotype. 
daguerreotypes are unique images. They don't have a separate negative. So to make daguerreotypes is a really complicated process. You have to develop them over the fumes of mercury. So you don't want to do this without the proper safety gear. <laughs> Uh, but they are incredibly high res images. There's a University of Rochester study that claims that a good daguerreotype can hold 140,000 megapixels of information in it. That is amazing to me. This is the first photographic process. It's no longer used by most photographers, but it's super high res if you're interested in that. Uh, so these brothers were using this really complicated, beautiful high resolution process to make these photographs. And I'm gonna show you what the Met, who owns these photographs today, says about them. So the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York owns these photographs and they say on May 26th, and of course they blocked the year here, uh, 1854, the Langenheim brothers made eight, and I've underlined that, eight sequential photographs of the first total eclipse of the sun visible in North America since the invention of photography. So if you recall, photography is invented in 1839. That was on the screen earlier. I might not have mentioned it, but photography is invented in 1839 by Daguerre, Louis-Jacques Mande Daguerre in Paris. He's a really interesting character, by the way. Uh, and so since 1839, these are the first people to photograph an eclipse in the United States successfully. Let me show you some more of their text. So the Met curators go on to say, in the Northern Hemisphere, the moon always shadows the sun from right to left during a solar eclipse. These images, therefore, seem odd because they are, like all uncorrected daguerreotypes, reversed laterally as in a mirror. So these images do not show the way that the moon normally shades the sun from right to left. If I zoom into this, these are the first images here. If I zoom in, you can see the moon is coming into the sun from the left and moving to the right. So these are reversed because these are on the back of a camera obscura. This is like the wall in the back of a camera obscura, and it's capturing this reversed image. So that's one of the fun things about daguerreotypes. If you look at text in a daguerreotype, if there was a sign in the background of a daguerreotype, you always see the words backwards. They're always reversed in a daguerreotype. Uh, if I scroll across these photographs, you can see the smaller photographs coming into view. So these are two larger cameras, and then smaller cameras were used. And the reason why there were originally eight of these daguerreotypes, and now there's only seven, is a really fun story. The seventh or eighth one should be right here. It's not there, and I'll show you what they say, why, in a moment. But that's where the total eclipse of the sun should be right here, but it's not in existence today. And I wanna read the text that they wrote about it to tell you why that is. So I'll keep scrolling across here so you can see the other images after the totality. Now we're looking at the, the sun moving off. And again, it's moving from left to right, away from the sun in the opposite direction that it actually goes. When we look at it with safety goggles, so safety glasses, uh, do not look at the eclipse without safety glasses on or look at it inside of a camera obscura. That's a very safe way to do it. So those two are the last of the seven that exist today. And now the reason why the eighth one doesn't exist is on the screen. So the Metropolitan curators say, there was virtually no available light when the disk of the new moon eclipsed the largest part of the sun. The missing total eclipse image was probably made on the smaller plate size and it showed nothing at all. So this, yeah, I love that too, by the way. So these early photographers were super excited, I'm sure, you know, about doing this. They must have practiced this a lot to make these early processes work this way. And then they captured the moment of totality, but they couldn't see anything. <laughs> Darn it. It wasn't bright enough for the daguerreotype film that they had been using. And so apparently it got lost. So the Met doesn't know where it is. It doesn't exist apparently today. All right, I'm just gonna remind you again that this is the same process. So Gemma Frisius' drawing shows the crescent of the sun up high, and then it comes down low. So those images of the crescent of the sun are very similar to these made by the Langenheim brothers back in 1854. And again, if you have daguerreotypes in your collection, definitely keep them.
You do not want to get rid of them. Those are very important photographs, in my opinion. Really cool to have some of those. I'm going to update us now in the history of photography to today, basically. Here's a photograph at the top of a very recent solar eclipse in April of 2023. So this is the kind of thing that we're going to be able to see in the near future this year, coming up this semester. There's a photographer named Aditya Madhavan who made this photograph of the solar corona during totality, and it was published by Forbes magazine. So I'm using the image from Forbes magazine. You can see the dark surface of the moon completely blocking the bright sun, and the corona of the sun is visible in that moment. My understanding is that this is the one moment, there's going to be three minutes, according to Dr. Dellenbush, three minutes of totality. This is the only time when you can safely, I believe, view the solar eclipse. So you do really want to be careful, by the way, during the eclipse, you definitely do not want to damage your eyes. So this is the only time that it's safe to look without protective glasses. But I love how a digital photograph from 2023 is done in the same way inside of a room. The room just keeps getting smaller. So the daguerreotype boxes were pretty big. Digital cameras now can fit in our pocket. So we've still got a tiny little room inside of those digital cameras. All right, now I wanna stress this with kind of big letters because we're gonna look at some really cool artworks now in addition. So everyday things that we all might take for granted namely the sun and the moon, become utterly surreal during an eclipse because we're suddenly reminded of how awesome they truly are. And one thing that I loved about getting invited to give this talk is I walked around the astronomy area more than I have in the recent past. And they have some wonderful displays right outside here. And if you read the text about the effect of the solar eclipse, there's a the first female hired by the Naval Observatory, and I have her name in my notes, but I can't remember it right now. She wrote the statement that's quoted outside on the, on the poster. And it says, the effect of the solar eclipse in the moment of totality is awesome to the, uh, what's the words that she uses? It's awesome to the max, basically, is what she's saying. She has a more beautiful way of saying it than I can remember. But it's just the most awesome thing she could ever imagine. It's awesome to the extreme. There it is. Awesome to the extreme. So if you're ready to see something that's awesome to the extreme, one thing that came to my mind is this next painting. And it may not be awesome to the extreme to you, but it is to me. This painting, I did not know, was an eclipse painting. This is done by a surrealist. So I chose the word surreal, you know, intentionally a moment ago. Here's Max Ernst, born in Germany. He's both a Dadaist, he starts the Cologne Dada movement. And again, if you're interested in learning about art history, uh, I can't tell you about all the different movements today, uh, but Dadaism is one of the most unusual movements. Really interesting ideas come out of the Dadaists. So Max Ernst is both a Dadaist and he then becomes a card-carrying surrealist. By 1925, he had officially joined the surrealists. I didn't know that this was a solar eclipse until I started researching for this talk. And I'm gonna say, this is a, an eclipse image. Let me show you why. I learned that there are particular kinds of eclipses called ring of fire eclipses, where the moon is closer to us. And so the sun is only partially blocked during the moment of totality. And you get a ring like this around the edge of the moon. I have never seen this in my life. Maybe some of you have seen it. I'm going to say this looks incredibly interesting, like fascinating to the extreme to me. Might be frightening even to see a ring in the sky like that. But I believe that this is the inspiration for Max Ernst's series of paintings like the one I just showed you. I'm going to put a map down here at the bottom now, if I can get it to show up. Here it comes. And this shows where the annular, these are called ring of fire eclipses or annular eclipses. And there was one recently. Uh, it started over here in, in, well, you could see it in the United States, over here in Oregon first, and in extreme North uh, uh, California. And then it went across the state of Nevada and uh, Utah, a little bit of my home state of Arizona, and then into New Mexico. My brother lives right in the center of New Mexico. He probably saw the annular eclipse. 
uh, and then down into Texas and out into the Gulf of Mexico. And then if we follow the path coming up on April 8th, that's why we're here today, is to be reminded of April 8th. That's the date that we all need to pay attention to uh, coming up. And it's gonna go from uh, Texas again, up into Ohio. Here we are in Bowling Green, Ohio, in Northwest Ohio. So happily, we're gonna have three minutes of that totality. It won't be a ring of fire eclipse, it's gonna be a total eclipse. And that's gonna be a really fascinating moment for us. I've never seen a total eclipse of the sun myself, and maybe I'm not alone. So I'm really looking forward to this. But I also wanna see one of these ring of fire eclipses someday. Let me bring back the uh, Max Ernst painting. So to me, this painting is so much more interesting now. It was always interesting to me. Like, what is that ring in the sky? Now I have a reference point for maybe he was inspired. I'm gonna say he was inspired by ring of fire eclipses. And one of the reasons why I think this is gonna come up on the screen now, I found four of these paintings. So probably that means there are lots more of them. And if you were wondering, like, what is this ring in the sky? Notice the title of this one, Forest and Sun. So that, to me, cements the idea that he has seen a ring of fire eclipse. And he's very likely repeating this image over and over because it was so intensely interesting to him as an artist, like it would be to me, uh, I'm sure. So Max Ernst is one of the most interesting artists, I think, to study in relation to ring of fire eclipses. I wanna show you now another uh, earlier artist named Mark Chagall. I teach the modern art history classes. So a lot of these um, uh, paintings and sculptures you're gonna see are related to my area of research and teaching. Uh, Mark Chagall is known as a magical realist. So uh, Max Ernst was a, a surrealist. Uh, now we're in an earlier period that inspires the surrealist called magical realism. The title here is I and the Village of 1911. This painting is also at the Museum of Modern Art today. And the Hunter book that I sometimes use claims that it was based on memories of his native village in Belarus. So he's thinking about his childhood and he must have seen an eclipse apparently. MoMA goes on to say that the large circular forms suggest the orbiting sun and moon in eclipse at the lower left. So I'm gonna zoom into the top and then we'll scroll down to the bottom and we can see the eclipse. One thing that I love about this painting is that it shows Marc Chagall's fascination with upside down images. Here are two houses that are upside down and there's a person who's upside down. That suggests to me that he knows about camera obscuras and he's putting these upside down images right next to eyes. Here's a human eye and it's connected to this animal's eye. So the same upside down images that are in the backs of our eyes that we're not aware of because our brains flip them right side up and all of that are still there on the backs of our eyes. So I think he's showing us in a way his knowledge of that camera obscura phenomenon. If I scroll up, I can show you more of this painting close up. The Sam Hunter book that I use sometimes also argues that this cow is actually the main subject of the painting. The cow is dreaming the rest of the composition, according to Sam Hunter. Really interesting thought. Again, this is a magical realist who's imagining maybe the dream of a cow. If we scroll up further here, we can start to see the moon coming into the view. And this larger circle is the sun. So the moon is just starting to um, eclipse the sun in this particular painting, according to MoMA. So magical realism is, is another phase of art history that's very interesting. I'm gonna quickly now move to constructivism. So a lot of isms in modern art history, by the way, as you may know, constructivists like Vasily Kandinsky, Kandinsky is one of the first abstract artists. Uh, some people say he was the first abstract artist. Uh, this particular work is called Composition 8. And of course the date is blocked. It's 1920 something, as I recall. Uh, and it's in the Guggenheim collection today, also in New York. The Guggenheim, like the Met and like MoMA have fabulous collections, as you can imagine. The Mansfield book that I use sometimes publishes this and the Guggenheim curators note that in, oh yeah, it's 1923, that's the date of the painting. In 1922, uh, Vasily Kandinsky was hired at the Bauhaus. If you know about the history of architecture, the Bauhaus is one of the most important groups of 
artists and architects inspire a huge number of later artists and architects. So Kandinsky is teaching in a hotbed of innovative thinking when he makes this painting. They also argue that this painting shows us colors and forms and their psychological and spiritual effects. Like the statement outside in the hallway that says viewing the eclipse is awe inspiring to the extreme. I think this artist is interested in those moments that have a psychological and spiritual impact on us. Like when I looked up at the stars in 1989 in a way that I did not expect to see and I never seen since, I was transformed in that moment. It was amazing to me. So I think this is one of those kinds of paintings that shows those psychological and spiritual effects. And another author named Simonowski argues that the upper left-hand side shows us an eclipse. So let's zoom into this work on the left side and then I'll scroll to the right side. So the eclipse is happening in the upper left. Again, Kandinsky is known as a constructivist. So a lot of this is structural. Again, he's working with architects in the Bauhaus the director of the Bauhaus is an architect named Walter Gropius, very famous architect. So he's thinking about structures, but he's also an abstract painter and he's painting an eclipse in this particular example. And one thing I have to mention that Dr. Layden brought to my attention, which I would encourage you to do, is to stare at the dark eclipse image and then move your eyes like over here. Stare at this image for a while and then move over here and you'll see the dark ring become a bright ring. Okay, good, I'm seeing some nods. So that is a very interesting visual phenomenon called the persistence of vision. And it's a very interesting thing that people like Kandinsky would have known about. And he's probably experimenting, I'm gonna say, with that idea. So thank you for bringing that to my attention, really cool idea. So that's one element of the painting. Another thing that I love about this painting, now that I know this is an eclipse, before I started researching this, I didn't know that that was an eclipse. Uh, I knew that it was a circle. Kandinsky loves circular forms. Uh, this is very likely a landscape. So with this being the sun, now I read this painting as a landscape, maybe with the pyramids, maybe Egyptian pyramids in the background. There's a horizon line in any case in this otherwise abstract painting. If we scroll across to the right, another thing that I learned, I love learning from other folks. So Dr. Layden again looked at this presentation in advance and he noticed that this is almost like a direction for us. It's almost like that spiral in Van Gogh's paintings that is a reference to infinity. So these lines that converge way off in the distance, this is Kandinsky telling us to look to infinity, maybe to look to the heavens, look to the stars, look to the eclipse. So thanks again for that idea as well. If I scroll all the way to, oh, I did scroll all the way to the right. Here is a comparison with one of the earlier works that we saw. I wanted to remind you that Calder is an abstract artist using sculptures rather than paintings. And interestingly enough, in this photograph of the yellow moon sculpture at the bottom, the photographer that made that photograph didn't know probably that I was gonna you know, make this comparison, but it turned out perfectly for me because the sun is oriented right where the sun is. The moon is oriented right where a moon is. Here's a yellow crescent of a moon. So we have interesting formal relationships here but again, the sculpture at the bottom keeps changing all the time. So I wanted and I tried to find a GIF, an animated photograph of that sculpture, but I could not find one. What I did find though, is a pretty high quality animated GIF of another sculpture that is mounted to the ground by Calder. So here's a Calder sculpture in an animated way. This shows you the same motions that are gonna happen with this sculpture and they're very smooth, very, you know, unless there's a, a lot of wind in the room, it's gonna be very slow, transformative kind of changes over time. So that gives you a sense of what looking at the sculpture in person is like. All right, maybe this is my favorite painting in the group. Uh, this is by Alma Thomas. Uh, she grew up in Washington, DC, but she was born in Georgia. And she saw an eclipse in 1970 and it was very impressive to her. This work is now in the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC, a fabulous free art museum. So I highly recommend you go to Washington, DC. Lots of the museums there are free. Hopefully this will be on display for you. 
The Smithsonian curators have written that this artist combines gestural abstraction and color field painting. That means that she's an abstract expressionist. So we've looked at surrealism, we've looked at magical realism, we've looked at constructivism, and now we're looking at abstract expressionism. All of these are important movements in modern art history. Notice what they go on to say, that Thomas's abiding sources of inspiration were nature, the cosmos, and music. So the cosmos, I think, the eclipse is what's really inspiring her here. She, by the way, is the first person ever to earn a fine arts degree from Howard University in 1924. So she is the first person to get a fine arts degree from that wonderful university. If I zoom into this, oh, before I zoom in, here is a photograph of Alma Thomas. And I wanted to show you this because it shows her standing before maybe this painting while it's being painted. It could also be a different painting that looks pretty similar but when I saw this, I knew I had to show it to you because sometimes we get photographs of artworks under construction and that might be the same painting uh, before it was finished. Now I can zoom into the bottom of this. I love abstract art, by the way. I always have, maybe that's why I like modern art history because there's a lot of abstraction in it. This is one of those works of art to me that totally shows the connections between representation and abstraction. This is an eclipse as the title suggests but it's also a kind of abstraction of that moment. She's interested in the light spectrum. So we have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. If you were in this classroom a few days ago, like I was, there's a wonderful display over here of the light spectrum. Really magical things happen when you put a prism in the path of sunlight and you get this amazing rainbow of colors. She's fascinated by that spectrum as well, I have no doubt. And, I also got this idea from, from Dr. Layden, thank you. I think, like he recommended, that this is an image of joy. I felt something profound when I looked up at the night sky in 1989, and it just will never leave me. I felt like I could touch the Milky Way. And I think she was so profoundly touched by this eclipse, like some of us are gonna be, and maybe all of us are gonna be, it really impacted her. So maybe this is a picture of the joy that she felt in that moment. It certainly has a lot of energy in it. And I do think it's a kind of joyous painting. So the moon here is the dark blue area. And then the solar uh, corona is this amazing spectrum of colors. If I scroll up here, we can see the entire composition. The Smithsonian curators say that the off-center quality of this moon is what makes the painting have motion. It suggests motion in the composition. All right. Here's another interesting comparison. So we have Alma Thomas, an abstract expressionist, making a somewhat representational, feel free to come on in, representational painting. And then we have um, Aditya Madhavan using a digital camera last year in 2023, capturing the moment of totality. So here's an abstract expressionist in the moment of totality and a contemporary digital photographer showing us what we're all gonna see in this moment coming up in April. I think I have two more examples. We've come now to the movement known as postmodernism. If you were to ask somebody in the School of Art, there's a quite a few School of Art students here and other faculty and staff members here happily. Thank you all, by the way, for coming. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, if you ask some of the students or faculty members, what period of time are we in now, right now today? I bet that most of the artists in the School of Art will tell you that they are in the postmodern era. That is a common answer to that question. Many scholars claim that Robert Rauschenberg is the first postmodern artist. And he made this work of the eclipse of the sun in 1980. It could be as early as 1971. That's why I put in notes here, circa 1971 to 1980. This is a, a lithograph and it shows at the top, a total eclipse of the sun. One way to think about postmodernism, by the way, was described by Lynn Cook, who is the senior curator of modern art at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Lynn Cook says that postmodernists like Rauschenberg create juxtapositions of ebullient heterogeneity. Ebullient heterogeneity is a definition of postmodernism. It's a really interesting mix of ideas that often aren't connected, but maybe they're so interesting that it doesn't matter that they're not connected. Uh, so there's this ebullient 
or maybe even joyful in a way, heterogeneity here. If I zoom into the top of this print, we can see more clearly that uh, solar eclipse in the moment of totality. Notice the references to abstract expressionism. So here's a nod to people like Alma Thomas, color field painting as it's called as well. Here's a photograph, I think, embedded in the print of a flower. If I scroll up here, here are some more photographic images that he printed into this image uh, of people walking on a street. Here's some more people riding in a raft on a river. We have three bighorn mountain sheep, like you would see maybe in Glacier National Park. Really cool place to visit again. Probably the night sky is gonna be amazing in Glacier like it was in Sequoia for me. So this artist brings together a lot of things that maybe don't fit together in the kind of normal way of thinking, but that's a typical thought process in postmodernism. So we're bringing things together and it's a kind of ebullient heterogeneity. One of the students that saw this earlier brought to my attention a very interesting point that the two sailboats at the bottom uh, are a particular kind of sailboat. And I'm not a sailor, but those sails, according to that student who knows a lot about sailboats, echo the forms of the crescent moon or the crescent sun during an eclipse. That's a really interesting thought. So maybe Rauschenberg intended that connection that that student saw. So by the way, I love to hear questions and, and your thoughts. I'm getting close to the end. So if you see things that I haven't mentioned that you would like to share, like my students know, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, so please ask questions. Here's the last comparison and I'll show you one more image. I wanted to bring back Mark Chagall, who again is the magical realist of the group that I showed tonight. Uh, Mark Chagall includes animals experiencing this solar eclipse. And I can't help but think that maybe Robert Rauschenberg is also wondering about the impact of the solar eclipse on animals. That's one topic that I would also love to learn more about too. Uh, so I'm looking forward to continuing to research, you know, the impact of eclipses. Let me also show you the final slide now. My, my uh, I'm gonna call him my friend. I've never met him. I almost met him. He was supposed to come to BGSU, but it fell through. Abelardo Morel, a photographer that I highly recommend you look up. Really interesting photographs. Here's what happens during a solar eclipse on the ground. So I want you to look up with safety glasses, but I also want you to look down. During the recent partial solar eclipse, which is maybe five years ago or something like that, 10 years ago, maybe time flies around here. But on campus, I saw a partial eclipse of the sun. And one of my favorite moments was just looking underneath trees. I see some nods. It is utterly magical to look at the image of the sun. This is the crescent sun projected over and over again, thousands of times on the ground underneath trees. What's happening is all the leaves are creating little apertures and they're like a camera obscura, but the sun is so bright that you don't need a dark room. So these little apertures create images of the sun all over the ground. So definitely look at that. It's happening every day as well, but we don't recognize it as very interesting because all of these things are round and we're used to that. But that is also an image of the sun projected on the ground. We only notice it when it's happening during an eclipse because it's so odd to see that crescent form repeated hundreds of times. It's very cool. So look up, but don't forget to look down as well. All right, that's the end of my presentation. Again, I would love to hear your questions uh, if you have any. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Feel free if you have questions. Often my students teach me things that I did not know. This happens every day actually, and I love learning. That's why I love teaching. So if you have ideas that you would like to share or questions you have, I would love to hear them. Yes, thank you. Yeah, good question. Oh, you're telling me. Okay, yeah, good. 
what an interesting thing. So animals get used to the pattern of the cycles. Is that what you're saying? Okay, yes. Okay, thank you for that information too. It would be very interesting to learn more about that. Could you repeat that? Yeah, please. For the animals um, Every year, they just happen to be blue. Um, it's just not necessarily Very cool. Thank you for sharing that information. Any other thoughts you want to add? All of us can help each other understand these phenomena better. That's one of the great things about being at a university, by the way, is moments like this where we've got a bunch of people with different expertise, different ideas. So thank you. Oh, yes, there's maybe a hand up here. Yeah. I, I actually have a question for the audience. Good. Thank you. I'm just wondering, uh, since today is so difficult to see the Milky Way, I'm wondering how many people here have never seen the Milky Way? There's quite a few. Well, like, it needs to be both a big and trip. Yeah. <laughs> and oh my God. It was so incredible to see the Milky Way so vibrantly. It was amazing. So yeah, if you have that opportunity, there was another hand up. I see two hands up. Yes, yes thank, thank you. you. And then we'll, yeah. oh, so it sort of jumped out to me with that. That's Earth painting. That's yes. Gray forest. Gray forest. So I went down to Hopkinsville, Kentucky to see the solo eclipse in 2017. Good. And um, something that's very noticeable about it is the color of everything, the sky, and just everything takes on this like very uncanny greenish gray pallor to it. And in that painting, I think you're absolutely right, but that's what he was depicting because that's a very good representation. It's something you don't see any other time, but like, Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I did not think about that, but yeah, that's very likely the case. It is. Thank you very much for sharing that. Yes. Deepa. Resources? Okay. Okay, yeah. I look forward to learning what you learned in that moment. Thank you. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, how interesting. That would be maybe the ideal viewing spot. I mean, I mean we're going to have a great spot here, by the way. But, they only get about a minute. So. Okay, yeah. So a minute of totality. Yeah. So, well, yeah, that would be a cool place. You would not only look at the leaves, you know, I mean, the images of the sun on the ground, but you could look at the animals and look at the plants. Yeah, I hope you're able to do that. Thank you for sharing that too. Any other questions or ideas you want to share? Well, I want, yes. Um, we can tell you that the best place that we've seen the Milky Way is the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah. Because okay. wow. that's a total dark <laughs> sky. And, um, it's just every night you see it. Okay, yeah. I have been to the Grand Canyon happily, but I did not see the same intensity that I saw that one night in Sequoia. But I can imagine it probably happens there as well. It does happen. I'm glad you got to see that. I hope everyone gets to see that. Yes. I'll add to that uh, a little closer to the home uh, in, in Michigan, uh, near the thumb is a dark sky site. Uh, it's, it's protected uh, and it's a good place to go see the Milky Way. So uh, especially in the summer, it's a great place to go. Thank you for pointing that out. Either way, thank you for all these great points and great questions. Uh, I wanna thank you for coming again tonight. And I appreciate learning with you about eclipses and the history of art. Uh, feel free to keep in touch with me. My email is on the screen. I would love to hear from any of you. If you're interested to keep in touch, please do. Uh, thank you again for coming and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll mention uh, as well, we've got eclipse glasses. Uh, Kate, if you could pull those out for us. Uh, if you want to pick some up, you can do it now. Um, we'll also have eclipse glasses uh, distributed along among
around campus, I should say, uh, the week before, starting April 1st through April 8th, uh, there'll be sites around campus at the Bowen Thompson Student Union, at the dining halls, uh, at the rec center, and one more place that's eluding me right now, but there'll, there'll be a lot of messaging about where to get Eclipse glasses. Um, if you do take them tonight, I just encourage you to keep them safe. If they get scratched or damaged, you should throw them away and get a new set. So uh, you don't want to risk, yes. as Dr. Hirschberger said, uh, your eyesight, especially to an artist, yes. a valuable. Uh, you do not want to damage your eyes permanently. Do not risk it. Yeah. Thanks again for coming, folks. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if you changed the talk. I just learned more every time. That's right. They have been good to you. Here we are. Thanks for coming. Really good. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks for bringing your side. Oh my gosh, you got to watch your head around. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm a little worried about this spot, but it's headed to Bob. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Good to see you, man. Go. It was very interesting. I mean, you know, it was imperfect. Yeah. And yes, well, it's kind of like in the Darius. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those are supposed to be kind of distressing. Yeah. But on that picture, I was. But you have to make sure that this window faces where the sun is going to be happening. You know, it would be a little bit of 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 Are there going to be a yeah, specific so like that. event on campus yeah. during the eclipse yeah. where like there's like yeah. specific yeah. like, yeah. like yeah. you yeah. or uh, yeah. a yeah. person yeah. Like, instructing yeah. and narrating? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Thank you. on thank eclipse you. day uh, at the stadium, uh, starting at about noon, we'll open the gates and we'll have 
uh, images on a big screen. Thank you, Provost Whitehead. Uh, thank you from our telescopes. I hope on the reading this building. Thank you so much. I want to take your class now. Please do. I love the fact that you love our history. I do. So we'll be able to watch the eclipse. We'll have people talking about the eclipse. Explains the world. Well, it kind of does. What does the time? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> but then I hear physics explain. Uh, yeah, we all I'll be like, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to more important <laughs> well, have lots of activities yeah, going on. Right. So, yeah, we along one of the sidelines, you're going to have so about cool to stand in here and practice with, with Dr. Bellenbush and Dr. Lane because right, they were seeing things that I wasn't seeing. And just like happened tonight, like the gentleman who brought up the point of the Max Ernst painting is the right kind of colors during an eclipse. So, maybe you know that. I don't know that. So, yeah, three, four, five hours of the eclipse from. First and contact the with the moon on the right? sun. Yeah. 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 Um, we all kind of um, pitch in together. Yeah, we'll have fun. things going on to so keep people yeah. entertained. I was talking to Andy. And and we'll have telescopes on the ground. I can look through with the um, picture of the. So I'm hoping yeah. that we just have small object. Yes. Good weather. <laughs> Good weather, mostly. Um, you know, and no, I know. the theory. Uh, okay. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Yeah. There still are. I can back up there. Back up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, bouncy houses. Make and, uh, sure I touch the right button here. Mini golf and stuff like that. Out Maybe I can back up. So the arrows. Do they work? Right up and say, I'll do a talk on this. Could you? Did you have an interest, or do you just have an interest in all? Uh, I have an interest for sure. Yeah, let me go. Here. Yeah, that Maybe little object I there. Yeah. Yeah. I do not know what yeah. that is. Yeah. Where is that? Like a little okay. sure. at the top. Yeah. There. Yeah. <laughs> You're not, um, <laughs> it looks like a space. Yeah. 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 Good question. <laughs> Excellent <laughs> question. Yeah, I do not know. <laughs> this is, uh, let's see, 1980, according to the private owners. Yeah, oh, I already got that. Okay. But it's a little bit. The scale isn't right. Am I right? Yeah, we'll talk to our business. Yeah, we'll talk to our business. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the aliens. Thank you. We understand the UFOs. Do you, if I have a more specific question, is there anyone that I should like to know? Have you been photographed that? Yeah, photographed that because yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, it is a good term. Yeah, the way we hear about the, uh, the uh, Are you like the director? I am. So so thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I'm so my name is my pleasure. By the way, Dr. Daniel and Dr. Lydia, they did a lot of work. So it worked out. Such a great group of my email address. Okay. You know what I can do? First one I was able to work into the schedule. Thank you so much. No, no, no. Great. Okay. Thank you. Feel free. Shoot me an email or on your name. Oh my God. Glad to be doing it. There's a laser fire coming. Ball of fire coming down. Yes. They can make it here. We're in trouble. Teacher. Absolutely. Yeah, going underneath your desk, it turns out, really isn't really any good. <laughs> this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. It must have been a lot of work to put all this together. And I wish I had been able to. Joy, you know, just bringing together people like Andrew and we had uh, last week. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a few. Colin is a professor or something in music. Colin is No, Colin just graduated. I have around 10. His bachelor's. But he gave us a fantastic yeah, talk yeah, about uh, uh, planetariums and, and the music that yeah. planetariums yeah. have yeah. used yeah. historically. That's interesting. And he's, it's, it's his research field. He's no been kidding. to the, the Adler Planetarium in Chicago yeah. and researched yeah. their records to, to figure out what music they use. Yeah, and, and sort of he, he talked really yeah. eloquently. I mean, yeah, he was, more eloquently he was than I can speak. Yeah. And he's <laughs> just applying to grad schools yeah. now. So. Yeah. Uh, About the history and how it's changed from classical music. It must be mm -hmm. high mm -hmm. art, right, to be in a planetarium like the one to one one sort of more electronic music mm -hmm. and, and spacey sounding music and things no, like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so yeah, he now it's probably rap. Well, and then there was the laser show here in the 1970s and 80s, right, for planetarium. Yeah, still kind of. Thing, yeah. 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 Well, we were noticing the acoustics in here, too, and how it's so nice because you can hear everybody's questions so easily. Yeah, yeah we had uh, the Precepta and uh, actually music research 
group that Colin, I think, co-started when he was a student, um, gave a performance here, and there was an original piece by, I think it's probably a graduate student, um, who composed it, uh-huh. and cool. so first time, it was yeah. meant That's for a planetarium, exciting. and this so was the first like, time it was actually wow, done in a planetarium, like a world premiere and, and, uh, planetarium. That's and uh, cool. yeah, I think we're going to have the early music ensemble in here in a couple of weeks as well, so it's going to be fun to sing in here. What are they performing? Um, some, you don't know the full program, but some Herschel, uh, Herschel discovered Uranus, but also, so he's an astronomer, but he's also a composer, and his father was as well. Uh, mm. so Real Renaissance of, uh, folks, huh? He's by Herschel, and I'm not sure what else Dr. Spohr has. Uh, Fun. That's next week? Uh, Ernie's gonna... Yeah, so we're still... I think we're going to do that on the 27th. So that's not part of the lecture mm. series. But, oh, okay. Um, the next week is. And it'll uh, be in the air? Yes. Because we are going to the acoustics in here. Yeah. Yep. Would be fun. And when yes. we were in choirs, often they would make us stand way apart from each other in a circle. I was thinking it'd be fun to sing. Yeah. Because you got to be able to, you got to know your part, you know, and then yes. they'd. Director would walk around and be like, You don't know your part. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're all singing a solo. Right, right. But you can hear each other. So, yeah, that's yeah. cool. Good idea. Next week's talk is Amokar, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Amokar. Okay. Well, I'll it's delightful. And I'm just so glad whoever's idea, I'm sure it was right. together to think of doing something yeah. like this. Um, your idea? Nice work. Really <laughs> great. Got to think of what we're going to do next year now. So get on that. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do that's common? You know, actually, I think that's a powerful plan. thing. Um, we'll get ready yeah, for 2099. Yeah. What, what is it? 2099. I don't care. It takes a little lead time. I don't care. <laughs> but there's going to be partial eclipse. Well, when yeah. you showed yeah. that map, I thought, this is probably it for me. I'm kind of thinking <laughs> I better make sure that. I'm there and seeing it. I, I drove down to Nashville last time to see it, and it was really cool. It took you two days. It to took me two days to get back. <laughs> I ended up. I didn't even know where I was. I was just following whatever the GPS told me to do to avoid the to avoid the traffic. You know, I ended up somewhere in Indiana. I don't know. <laughs> I had the same experience in Did Tennessee. You? Yeah. yeah. My son Tennessee. and I were just so you were, you were probably right with me. That's I was right. like, yeah. where are we? I don't know. As long as I get home, but yeah, took a lot longer. But it was it was pretty cool. It was. It's worth the trip. And Please now it's coming up. Thank so. you. I know it's exciting. Uh, thank you very much. We very much enjoyed time. all this. Thank, thank, thank you, you for doing coming. it because it's thank a lot of effort. I, I you know. I'm sure. Okay, thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. you. Great to I see love you again. your advocacy for Thanks for coming. I love physics too. Okay, me too. Yeah, we uh, they're they're married a lot of hard drives. Um, the teachers or the kids are looking at you. Um, so, so when is your class? When are your class? Well, I have so one here on architecture, on track, but uh, something yeah. still wasn't quite working right. It's not part of the networking. But it is. You've made progress. Yes, it's all right now. And when it was installed in 2014, 15 years ago, basically, you know. It was a good system, okay. um, but like all technology, sure. it's designed to last in the 10 years, years, not 40 years. <laughs> I, yes. um, you know, and so it's, it's getting close to, to think about this, but um, we, we were in Oregon. Yeah, I haven't tried to get a quote yet. Um, I suspect a few hundred thousand. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so, um, a couple of months. Sounds and I, I don't know that not together is that okay? So we're teaching the art. <laughs> so, that out, I mean, no, I and I don't, I mean, part of the last episode was new seats and things. From it. Yeah. Basically, okay. Okay. we took an artist and I did but, all the um, history part of it, but okay. I just did, you know, you can do we, so we did learn right. last you fall that the so I did all the history and had the no women that were with us that were so, artists. Yeah, we're they emailed me the a project. You know, the clock is and the sure. uh, so style so of whatever that artist was. And these kids are in second grade okay. or something. It was so much fun. Okay. But I learned all about the kids. We, we, we did cat on the dance so, okay. you know, mobiles. Sure and we did okay. all okay. kinds of stuff. And I just know so much of the art now because I got to start. Yeah, yeah.